You're listening to Packers Talk Network. PackersTalk.com Do you want to experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game tickets from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay. Just go to their website, theticketking.com. Again, that's theticketking.com. Stuff like that. Um, but it's just like the most ridiculous I mean, so flamboyant far. version you can imagine. And then they do English voiceovers for the announcers who are just always dressed incredibly <laughs> garishly. And it's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Alright, I'm, I'm in. It sounds, it how, sounds like something I would enjoy. Brian, Dude, how do you, you'll, you'll how do you hooked. know? Where have you heard the word garishly? Read a read a book. John. How how did you how did you say that word? I I, I never knew I was such a vocabulary whiz until John told me. I'm sorry, okay, John. I'm... You not know about Charles Dickens? Maybe a man named Charles Dickens, John. I'm sorry, but the word garishly kind of <laughs> blew my mind a little bit. Uh, okay, Brian. Man, I also used flamboyant in that description. Well, that's really a common. Of how that's a common that word, but garishly but to use is like the next and level. Garishly in the in the same description, I feel proud of. I do like okay. that. John I get that. <laughs> just compliment on Brian for his word choice, and then Brian was like, "Yeah, but I also use this other word." <laughs> <laughs> Give me all of the credit I deserve. Check New York Bozo! New York Bozo! New York Bozo! New York Bozo! I gotta get my biceps a little bigger. Yeah, you can always work on that. Oh, I could sure use a hot dog with chili. You know what time the game starts? Hey, you got any left-handed footballs? We need to fire him. Is anybody else tired or is it just me? Good thing I'm going to show you. You got any eligibility left? I got some advice for y'all. Take two weeks off, then quit. Good evening, Packer Nation. Welcome back to another edition of Pack to the Future podcast. We are in week 17 of the NFL season, and the Packers have fought their way back into this whole shebang, and we are now playing for the NFC title this week against the Detroit Lions going to Ford Field, and um, a little fun fact for you guys, I'm sure you probably have heard this one by now, but um, this will be the fourth straight season the Packers are playing for the NFC title in Week 17. Have you guys heard that before? I've never heard that before. I just, I just is, did. I literally just did. This is this is a fact. This is going to be our fourth straight year that we are playing for the NFC North title in Week 17. Um, the only the only time we've lost has been obviously last year against Minnesota. But um, hmm. you know what? We lose one, and I don't, I don't think the Packers are capable of losing two of those games in a row. Um, but we're we're going to talk all about it tonight. Um, first, I just want to hear how you guys are doing tonight. So, Brian, how are you doing tonight, buddy? I am doing fantastically. I just I skied two days this week. I've got the the leg power back under me in these beautiful mountains of Colorado. Are you sure I'm you have leg power right now? Well, not right now because I skied okay. today. But <laughs> <laughs> I skied. It'll be recovered oh, by no. tomorrow. No, take take that back. I I went snowboarding one time last year, and I felt. I don't know. I don't know if you fall a lot, Brian. Maybe you did when you were learning or something. But I fell on the same spot of my body. Every time I fell down, it was like it was on my left hip. And I swear I like I swore off snowboarding for the rest of my life after that one time. I'm like, nope, fat guys are not allowed to snowboard. Um, Come skiing, ski, buddy. Ski, maybe. I don't know. I'll try that. I'll try that out maybe this winter. And um, if I have the same go. if I have the same if I have the same go with snowboarding, I'm going to I'm just going to ice fish. So, um, yeah. Dusty, Dusty, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, man. It's been uh, unseasonably warm here in Kentucky, uh, and so I've I've not been skiing. I've never been skiing, but uh, man, I every now and then I get into my chair and walk around. So I've I've got some leg power as well, nice. Brian. All right, brother. Nice. So you're not the only one. So I'm I'm also very athletic. I'm very proud of you and, and good good looking. You just been walking around in your um, Pride and Glory T-shirts all, all week. I have been, yeah, and my bracelets just that's. Just all, just all around the house. It's early around. plug, early plug. <laughs> Check it out. I love it. Um, but dude, that is that is that is awesome that you're you're experiencing some warm some warm weather. Um, yeah. I 
I wish I wish we had that around these parts, but you know, winter winter is winter, and we deal with it. So, um, guys, I'm very excited to announce this. I am going to be partaking in the coin toss this week. Ooh, I have I no idea nervous. how this is going to go. I am nervous uh, more than you are nervous. Trust me. Um, this can really only time. go one of one ways, <laughs> <laughs> and that's gonna. Be, it's just gonna be terrible. Stay tuned. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a fun person to watch the Packer games with, but um, as far as knowledge, um, we'll just see what happens. So, but it is now time to get into our patented coin toss segment. And um, first things first, let me start you guys off with your question. And then we'll go from there. So the first question that I got for you guys is it's about Clay Matthews. Obviously he had, he had a phenomenal game. He had, he had a nice forced fumble, a sack. Um, I mean, the guy looked legit out there. Um, And I'm wondering what the cause of that is. Is, is this a 100% Clay Matthews or is this a benefit of a very weak left tackle that he was going up against? So Brian, if I flip the coin and it is, it is heads, you will be telling me that this is a one hundred close to one hundred percent healthy Clay Matthews, and we'll go from there. And it is heads, Brian. So, you're this is a one hundred percent Clay Matthews. Ugh, this is the beauty of the coin toss because this is not how I feel, but I have to make this case. <laughs> Don't make excuses for yourself. Just answer it, Brian. I just need I just needed to preface. All right, hundred percent Clay Matthews. It's because I believe that it's 100% Clay Matthews. I believe that he is back, that he can, believe, he can make believe, some plays believe, for us down the stretch. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen him do it throughout his entire career, even in stretches where he is struggling. He'll just have this one random magical game and, you know, he'll kind of snowball from there. So I believe that's because I choose <laughs> to believe. Um, and I mean, this game, was so much better than anything we had seen from him all year long. You know, even like some of those early sacks that he had in the season, you know, all like two of them, you know, that was, you could clearly see a quarterback kind of being pressured from another side right into the loving arms of Clay Matthews. And he would just take advantage and just tackle a guy. Um, he was, he was beating his man this week. Um, he's faced poor left tackles, earlier in the season and not done the same thing. So I can't, I can't just only say that it's because he played against Clemmings, who is just awful, but man, you also saw him bat down a pass. You saw him putting pressure at times where he didn't get the sack. He, he was just all over the place and playing, you know, maybe not like Clay Matthews of old, but definitely better than we'd seen all year long. So I don't think it's just matchup. Uh, he, he, passed the eyeball test, which he hasn't passed for me for a long time. So that's really all I can say. Clay Matthews, and I think you can look for him to make a lot of plays down the stretch here. All right, Dusty? Uh, I could tell Brian wholeheartedly. I uh, believe that from his long intro. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't there you go with that, Brian. I mean, and to Brian's point, I mean, he looked, Matthews looked better. Uh, he looked faster than he had. He looked more active than he had. Uh, which was encouraging. However, as Brian mentioned, he was also going up against TJ Clemmings. And TJ Clemmings, like, I haven't watched a ton of TJ Clemmings, but I've seen enough to know that he is, he is, he is not good. In fact, he is bad. Uh, I've watched enough Marshall Newhouse to know that he may be on, like, Newhouse level. Like, he doesn't <laughs> move well. He doesn't, he barely seems to know, like, what he's doing on a lot of it. He plays way over himself. I saw so many times where he just kind of would stand in one place and kind of rotate and just reach his arms out like Frankenstein's <laughs> monster and, like, just try to push somebody. <laughs> These are, like, grown men racing around the edge and he's just, just, uh, like, you can't do anything else. Um, Clay got, uh, two knockdowns in this game, which was very exciting. Uh, one of which I, I actually just, just watched, just wrote about this. Uh, one of which I think would have gone for a very large gain. Uh, the other one high kind of maybe red, uh, they were both wide receiver screens. Uh, but that could have gone for a touchdown, uh, kind of from the five yard line, like on both of them, <laughs> like, yeah, Matthews knocked him down, man. That was cool. Uh, like Clemmings on the, one of them was supposed to cut him. <laughs> Just like, just barely hit him in the belly. And so like, <laughs> and then even then, like he hit him in the stomach and then Matthews kind of like doubled over like you would when like a, a large man hits you in the stomach with his helmet. 
and Clay Math or, or and Sam Bradford instead of throwing it, pump fakes it. He actually did not throw the screen until Clay Matthews was upright again. Like that's a play you've got to cut someone on. The other one that he knocked down, they didn't even bother cutting him. It was a free rusher off the edge of the wide receiver screen, and no one bothered to cut him. Like Matthews was there to make those plays, but like I may have been able to make those. Plays. Maybe not the second ones because I would have gone down and cried when Clemmings hit me in the stomach. But I, I mean, an black rusher to the wide receiver screen side is something that will get knocked down every time. Like it doesn't matter who it is, it's gonna get knocked down. Clay looked better. But he was going up against terrible, terrible competition. Uh, I'm, I, I, I think he is getting healthier. I don't think he's anywhere close to the clay that we have known for years. I mean, that's this is um, this is both some very good arguments here, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tend to lean more towards Brian on this one. I think that I think I think that. I think that Clay Matthews has always had that competitive spirit and that just fiery attitude and his body just was not allowing him to, to make those plays. So you gotta um, believe I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say, you gotta believe, you gotta believe. I mean, that's what this season is all about is just believing. So we believe that the Packers can run the table. Look at us, look at where we are now. So I want to let everyone know that before this show, I made fun of John singing and he told me I was going to lose a coin toss because of it. Rigged. And then, and here we are. We're just and right here. here. So I, here I, you know what? I are. lost, but I, I had it coming. I had it coming. I understand that. I understand the game now, John. Well, nowhere, Dusty, ladies and is, gentlemen. This is a per- <laughs> nowhere, nowhere else are you going to find a podcast competition that is more rigged than this one. <laughs> this is. <laughs> Rawr, we're so we're so catty with each other. <laughs> like the the coin toss part's legit, man. We actually tossed that coin, but I like the we decisions do. are made the decisions, way before the, recording time, is my understanding. Is, the winners and losers. That is guys. nothing's more. Rigged. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right, All right. guys. I apologize well, for making fun of. Or you singing Smash Mouth? I think John was singing Smash Mouth before the show, and I he deserved I to be. Should have made fun of you, John. You. Yeah. You are an all-star. How dare John. you? Get How your dare game you on. mistake Drake for Smash Mouth? I oh, think yeah, that it you was will Drake. lose right, yeah, every bad. coin toss <laughs> from here on out. John, another word you're out done, of you and you lose your next one. All right. All right I'll, shut up. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Those are words, John. I told you no more words. Okay. We're talking about Randall Cobb here. All right. Randall Cobb's been struggling with injuries, struggling with production, all kinds of things. So the question we're going to ask here is do we need to have a serious conversation in the off season about cutting Randall Cobb? All right, I'm going to flip this coin. And uh, Dusty, if it's heads, you're going to say that we should talk about cutting him. If it's tails, you're going to say that's crazy. Absolutely not. It is tails. That's crazy. Absolutely not. That's crazy. Absolutely not. There you uh, go. argument over um i mean anyone who <laughs> listens to this knows that i am a big big fan of randall cobb uh he went to kentucky uh, i went to kentucky we're basically the same person uh so i've been cheering for this guy for a very very long time uh he's still very very good like he missed i, I always talk a few a couple games ago when he was i believe he was targeted once but it was actually on a rogers throwaway he caught no passes against the bears uh he was out this past game against the vikings with an injury uh, he, there's, he sat out practice, uh, this week, I believe there's still talk of whether or not he's going to be able to play this week when he's in and when he's healthy, he's still very, very good. Now what he's out with this time is an ankle injury. Um, Cobb, Cobb does not have a whole lot of straight line speed. He's fast, but he's not like, he's not a burner where he excels is his, uh, his quick cut game. He can make people miss in very short spaces. I've seen him take wide receiver screens as the guy's flying down, just like one quick step to his right. And the guy flies by him. His quick cutting game is, is that's what he bases his game around. Uh, he's tough. And that ankle injury just really kills that quick cuts. Uh, it kills his ability to make those cuts. It kills his ability to uh, bounce off any tackles. Any it, Basically anything anything his game is based on, and even like mediocre ankle injury kind of kills that. So I think Cobb is still good enough to be, we got two years left on this deal. Uh, he's still good enough to be a very, very productive player. I really love him in this offense. Uh so I th- I think he's going to be fine. I think it's just it's an unfortunate injury at an unfortunate time, but I don't think there's any reason we should we should even start talking about uh, cutting Randall Cobb at this point. 
All right, John. Let's see what you got. First coin toss ever. I, I was just wait. I was just waiting for you to introduce me. It sounds. It sounds really. It sounds really nice to be introduced. And um, and you know what? Um, I'm just gonna. I've been hiding. I've been hiding behind uh behind all these intellects, and I'm gonna I'm gonna join in on the intellect side of the of things right now. And um, and I'm gonna say that you know I think that I think that the Packers should very much consider cutting Randall Cobb this off season. I mean, right now, right now to cut him, um, it would cost, it would cost the Packers a lot of money. Um, but come, come post, post, uh, June 1st, um, if the Packers would cut him, we would, we would be eating 3.25 million, which is, which is not a lot. And I mean, th- just the football side of things, um, Cobb really has not been healthy for us. Like, you know, when he has he's had one really healthy season and that was in 2014 and he put up phenomenal numbers for us, but every year after that it's he's been in and out of the lineup and when he's in the lineup he's playing with injuries and it's just it's hard to con- it's hard to count on someone that's not like in there every single week, you know, grinding it out with these guys and we got some young guys coming up here um, Geronimo Allison, for one, I mean, he is an undrafted rookie free agent and he looked really, really good last week. Um, and on top of that, we got Trevor Davis, who, I mean, he is, he is a speedy guy that can play the slot. Um, I mean, obviously, obviously he's not going to be Randall Cobb, but when you're talking about saving close to $6 million next year to potentially re-sign guys like TJ Lang or Nick Perry, um, I think that that is something to highly consider and um it's just it's really it's really it's it's definitely an area um that's not easy to talk about because i mean randall cobb is a beloved packer he probably always will be um for his whole career and the state farm commercials with rogers are on <laughs> po- they're on point but i think the packers should legit look into it i mean it's it's definitely something to at least look into and like I said, we've been drafting wide receivers these last couple of years, and we've got some really good guys coming up, and it, we could possibly see the last of Randall Cobb in Green Bay this year. Dusty, do you believe in beginner's luck? I knew, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. No, I don't believe in it. <laughs> no, me neither. Dusty, you win that Woo! round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. man, you had me. Oh, you had me. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually thought that that would um, a lot more solid than I thought that it would go. So um, hey, I'm going to pat myself on the back and cor- congratulate Dusty on his victory. It, well, it John, didn't, John, it didn't go more solidly than you thought it would. <laughs> don't pat Shoots. yourself on the back too much, John, because guess what? You <laughs> got another one, brother. You got you got another one. I have another this chance. Is, you got another chance. So you're saying this there's is, a chance? I'm very. I'm gonna I'm say you have a very very small chance, John. But a chance is a chance, my brother. So uh, about as much of a chance as Jordan has every week. So look, man, uh, the Packers good. were four and six, and we had I I had written them off for the playoffs. I gave them no chance. So you know what, John? You got that same chance. It's time to run the table, my brother. Run the so table. Here is the question for George, for John and Brian. It's Julius Peppers. So is the Packer strategy of limiting Julius Peppers snaps early in the season paying off now with some of the plays he's making down the stretch? Uh, I have a coin here. John, if it's heads, you're going to say that the strategy paid off. And it's heads, John. The strategy paid off. Well, this is this is very very convenient for me because I I am a firm believer that this strategy paid off. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cross sports here real quick and talk about one of the best coaches in the NBA of all time, and that is Greg Popovich. Greg Popovich. This is an a, NFL podcast, John. I know it is. I know it is. But let me make my point, okay? Greg Popovich had some very veteran players on his team, um, notably Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and Manu Ginobili, and and he he pretty much created this thing that the NBA got really ticked off at, where he would just sit these guys to limit their minutes, so that when it come when it came playoff time, they were they were healthy and ready to go. And when you look at when you look at um, Julius Pepper's snap snap counts, it was through the first. Um, six weeks and in this in the first six weeks 
the Packers were four and two, and their losses were to teams um, Dallas and they were to Minnesota. And at that time, Minnesota was playing their butts off. And obviously, we all know where Dallas is at right now. I mean, Dallas um, is is a top seed in the NFC right now, and they're playing really good football. So I mean, either either way, even if even if Julius got consistent snap counts in the seventy percent percentile, I mean, it his his impact on the field may not even have garnered a Packers victory. So um, I'm going to go ahead and say that the strategy did pay off solely based on the fact that we are seeing a healthy, a healthy and sort of, sort of well-rested Julius Peppers um, going into, going into this playoff stretch here, hopefully. Brian. Okay. Okay. It has not paid off. It's just, it just, it hasn't. All right. So let's look at the numbers here. The only number that I'm, I'm looking at a stat sheet right now. The only number that's really jumped up is tackles. And you would really hope that a linebacker playing more would get more tackles anyway. But, I mean, you, you look at the other stats. Um, he's got seven and a half sacks this year. Three and a half of those came while his snap count was much lower, right? So, since increasing his snap count, he only has half a sack more. Okay? That's not great. Um... Then you look at the forced fumbles. He's got two on the year, one of which has come during this stretch. So he's you know, he's not making no plays, right? But he's not really doing that them at a higher rate than he was before. The numbers that he's putting up right now are what you would expect out of Julius Peppers in you know, earlier in the season when his snap counts were lower. Uh, he's he goes missing for long stretches. And you say, man, why is Peppers getting more snaps? And then he'll get a sack. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. But you kind of just forgive all of those plays that he didn't make before. Um, he's struggling against the run, which is not characteristic of him. Just he's – I appreciate the plays he's made. You know, the the force fumble against Chicago was a big one. It, it really, you know, got us off on the right foot in that second half. But – Man, uh, he's he's still missing for big stretches of these games, and you would expect bigger numbers considering his his snap count has gone up, and they're not there. Uh, this is this is tough, man. This is tough. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with Brian because he used stats, and I like stats. Uh, sorry, sorry, John. <laughs> I considered you, but that's man. Just that's a clean sweep your first hey, time. Consideration sorry, is all. John. Consideration is all I ask for, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And that's and that's and that's what it comes. I down love the to. cross sports and stuff, man. You reached over the NBA. I love that. That was good. That was a really good start. Like it was, it's, it was solid, <laughs> man. It was solid. He doesn't care about winning. He cares about consideration. <laughs> Sounds like a dumb capers mindset to me. Oh. Well, well, hopefully, hopefully, this is one of a few times where I am uh, forced into this situation. But um, hopefully, hopefully, my thoughts were credible, and um, I can tell you about something that is very super credible. And that is the quality of clothing from Pride and Glory clothing line. Um, boy, this guy, Fred Fred Thurston, just produces the most quality shirts and notably Packer shirts that you could ever ask for in your entire lives. So um, I really encourage you guys as a playoffs draw, draw nigh and, and the Packers' chances of making the playoffs look pretty solid. You're gonna want some nice lucky shirts. I don't know if, if you have a shirt that the Packers have lost in this year. Burn it <laughs> and buy something, and buy something from Pride and Glory, and get some new stuff. They got some super awesome, super awesome shirts, and you can find them at Pride and Glory six three dot com. Again, that's Pride and Glory six three dot com. Quick note about Pride and Glory. I ordered my shirt right around mid season. It came in. Um, starting right after that loss to Washington, I started wearing that shirt underneath my Aaron Rodgers jersey every week, and we have not lost since. See what I'm saying? Order one of those that's, shirts, man. That's, Order them and they're, now. You know what? They're not, they're not they're expensive hot. to kick off a huge winning streak to get you to the playoffs either. I mean, that's it's a, it's right, a good price right. for, a, for a run the table type run, so it's good. Mm-hmm. Make it happen. Pride and Glory clothing, so hot right now. <laughs> Go get it. All right, guys, we have a very special guest joining us tonight. We got Chris Lemieux 
He is a writer slash podcaster for Pride of Detroit. It is an SB Nation group. Chris, how are you doing tonight? I am uh, pleasant. I am. That is probably the best ver. Uh, ad, adjective. <laughs> adjective. I remember the English language. I've not taken enough of this Applejack to the face just yet to forget it. I was just saying I'm pleasant for that. For a that. B. You got my name right off the bat. Like I have usually had to struggle with people about it, and that is probably fueling <laughs> half the reason I might eventually convert to Islam and change my name. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm. I am also um, an. A, a advocate of of hockey, and I mean, you share a name with one of the oh, legends. Sure. I mean, I any 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 relation? Or are we are we in the presence of greatness? I get that right a now? lot. I get no 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 relation. However, I get that a lot. And doubling up to this, my cousins on my mother's side do live in West Pennsylvania, and they are all Penguins fans. So it makes it even more hectic and confusing. But no relation. It's actually a very common, like, Quebecois name, even though, like, my family is predominantly Italian. So it's, uh, yeah, no relation to Claude. You have, you have, you have family in, in Pennsylvania. So, I mean, that pretty much makes you family of, of, of the great one. So, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I would say this, though. My dad bought me, however, a custom Red Wings jersey one year. And he made the mistake, again, custom, so it's got my name on the back. The problem is, a Red Wings jersey with Lemieux does not mean Mario. It means someone else, another Lemieux, very hated in Detroit. Someone who got his ass kicked back in the 90s. Oh, yes. So I can't wear oh, boy, it. I can't we, take it anywhere. It just sits there. We could. I, th- I feel like you and I could talk talk all day about early thousands and late 90s Red Wings, because that, that was my, that was my well, jam actually, back in the day, but... I don't actually watch that much hockey. I am far more of a Pistons fan because I actually have like ties to the bad boy era. My dad knows Bill Lambeer. My first game I was on the court with like for warm up with like Grant Hill. I, I have far more connections with basketball and I enjoy it more. I, I watch some hockey, but more often than not, I'm with my friends from Texas and we're just making jokes to piss off hockey Twitter. <laughs> And I mean, I mean, I mean, just getting getting into the business, Chris. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're we're the the Detroit Lions. I mean, you mm-hmm. guys have you guys have had two phenomenal players um, in your organization. Some some you could argue that they're all time all time great. I mean, obviously Barry Sanders is an all time great. Obviously Calvin Johnson. You, I mean, in my in my eyes, he is an all time great. And um, it's very interesting. This is my first question. I'm going to ask you. It seems. It seems that the offense is almost a little bit better. I don't know. And this is where I want your take on it. But from my perspective, it almost seems like the offense is clicking a little bit better without Calvin Johnson. And I just want to hear your take on on that statement. It's been a really rough one to parse because on the surface, it sounds God. Can I swear on this podcast? It sounds New York. ludicrous, the idea that this offense would ever get better without Cal- Calvin Johnson. It sounds <laughs> damn ludicrous, but I mean, the numbers look fine. It's it's dropped off in the second half here. The Lions, you know, you, you saw some e- explosive kind of early in the year. You saw that kind of come back with the Saints, but there's been a lot of games where they've s- struggled to really score more than like 20 points. So it's kind of been up and down in that regard. It's just just as far as like scoring. But I think part of that also comes from the fact that this offense as like a whole still isn't fully powered. There's no real run game to speak of. Like losing Amir Abdullah before the season kind of hampered that. But I mean, granted, throughout all of Calvin Johnson's career, they never had a run game in Detroit. Anyway, they haven't had a run game since Barry Sanders. But, but, I would say it sounds insane that the offense is better without Calvin Johnson. It is objectively true. It is objectively true by the numbers that the offense is better in 2016 than it was in 2015. I would not say it's better without him. I think that if Calvin Johnson was on this offense today, it would be even better than it is because there's no real way like... like. Uh, Basically, to game this out, you would be saying the Lions probably have the same personnel they have, except drop Marvin Jones, get back Calvin Johnson. So then your receivers are 
Golden Tate, Calvin Johnson, Anquan Bolden in the slot, Theo Riddick out of the backfield, Eric Ebron at tight end. I would say that's probably better than what the Lions have right now, and they'd be doing even better. It's just a matter of that the offense itself was all the offense was already in flux when when Jim Bob Cooter took over last year, Calvin Johnson was still there. But I think what's happened is you got Anquan Bolden, who's phenomenal out of the slot, and you've got an improved Eric Ebron, and you've got just more options for Matthew Stafford to play with. The downside is that there's just no deep threat on this team. Like, Golden Tate's remarkable in that he has had so far a thousand yards receiving, with more, most of those yards actually coming after the catch. Like, so of those thousand yards, I think it's like something like 560 are coming after he, he, he receives the ball. So he's a deep threat in that sense, in that he's just really hard to tackle. But I mean, there's no one like Calvin Johnson on this team. Like that kind of guy who can just go up there and just bruise and punch with guys all day. There's no one like that. So I think if you had that with this offense, it'd look even better. So I guess, again, long rambling answer. Yes, this offense is better without (laughs) Calvin Johnson, but if Calvin Johnson was with this offense, it would be even better than it is right now. Okay. And, and, um, the next question I think that, um, we want to hear on our side of the mics is give us an update on Matthew Stafford's injury and kind of just how he's been playing and, uh, in these last couple of games with that injury. This is a glove watch. Are we talking about glove watch? All right, we're on to glove watch. I like this. I'm gonna take a little swig. <laughs> um, okay, glove watch. So the news originally that came out about his finger was uh, scary. <laughs> it was like, okay, yeah, your finger can bend at a ninety degree angle. <laughs> However, as it was pointed out, Derek Carr had this had this same type of injury. It has a name that I cannot say or even look up right now because I don't want to be tapping on my keyboard. <laughs> It's it just it's scary. You hear that sort of thing, you're like, oh god, how can you do this? And the difference is there too. Derek Carr had that on his pinky finger. This is on your middle finger, which is pretty crucial for controlling the spiral of the ball. Don't fact check me on that. I don't know. I just I, it's kind of just simmering in my head. It, it sounds, sounds right. right. It, it sounds, sounds right, and sounds that's right. what matters in the 21st century. <laughs> you just have to sound right. You don't actually have to be right. The people who are objectively right are just annoying sods. They are. They're just. They're, no one likes them. No one likes them because they are the ones who come in and say actually. So if you think I'm wrong, just don't come at me because if you do actually, I'll just probably block you. I mean. <laughs> All right, glove watch. So yeah, he, he gets he gets the glove for line. Yeah, glove, the, watch. glove watch because he gets the glove and Lions fans flash back to 2011 where he had the same glove and he was just awful when he had the glove on. Uh, he's made a few more mistakes. I mean, obviously he's been, but at the same time he's also been going up against much better defenses. I find. So he's making a couple more interceptions, but by and large, we still saw throws during the Giants game that says that whatever impact he has, he's he's having right now, it's actually minimal. I would say probably what impacts the offense right now more than the glove on his hand and the fact that again, he can do a really neat trick with his finger going 90 degrees, which that's fun. That's fun. But I would say more than that is the fact that starting center Travis Swanson has been out the last two games with a concussion. And I'm a believer in centers in this league. I believe in them being very smart and being kind of anchor points to the offensive line. And the fact that with Travis Swanson out, it moves someone else who was playing guard, starting a guard to center, and then there's a hole at guard. So any, most of the mistakes that, that Matthew Stafford's been making have been because of the fact that, uh, these, the, the line's just been different. The line has not been as good. I don't think there's too much of it from the hand, per se. So I think he will be fine on that. I mean, granted, he could get banged up more, but he seems to be doing pretty well protecting that hand. All right, and that leads me to um, to our last question, which is going to be a two-parter. Um, it's going to be, what do the Lions have to do to win on Sunday? And then um, after after you give us their keys to victory, um, I want you to give me a final score prediction. Oh, no. You, you said those words. Okay, fine. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, let's start, let's start with um, the keys. I have no keys here to jingle. 
Why do we have? Why are they always keys? I, I'm very curious about that. Why are they keys? Like, are they, is this a car we're starting? Why are there multiple keys for a car? Is it like a really heavy padlock? I think I think John I think John Clayton coined the term. Oh, cool. I think John Clayton coined the term, and we just roll with it because everything oh, he cool. says that is just turtle headed freak. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So keys number one, like I think, I, I think I even said this when I was on, uh, with our podcast the other day, there, there's going to need to be uh, a shootout. And I think that's actually quite possible at this point. Um, I mentioned Travis Swanson a little earlier. He was, um, practicing on Wednesday. So that's a very good sign. He is coming through the concussion protocol. Uh, cornerback Darius Slay is also back. A lot of the reason the Lions have been getting really burned is that since Darius Slay left middle of the Giants game, uh, they've had no weapons to stop guys like Des Bryant or Odell Beckham Jr. I don't know if there's anyone like that for the Packers, but I mean, Aaron Rodgers makes everyone good, kind of. I, I, I'm still worried about the idea of a play like we saw from Chicago, which, uh, that was very Chicago of them, I've got to say. Just, you know, everything looks fine and you just give up a blow over the top like that, which is just why the Bears are just awful, pathetic little <laughs> pig heads. But, but, but having Darius Slay back shores up the defense a little bit. Having Travis Swanson back, hopefully, if he's, if he plays, it looked pretty all right on the offensive line. Oh, hopefully Golden Tate's healthy, but more or less, it's going to have to be a shootout because, uh, I mean, I look at I look at you guys. I look at what the Packers have played the last few offenses, and I, I'm sorry, I'm just not impressed with the, the offenses y'all have beaten. The Eagles with Carson Wentz, uh, Texans who um, their quarterback doesn't even play anymore. Five interceptions out of Russell Wilson, probably the most god awful performance I've seen out of him. Sam Bradford, probably the best quarterback y'all have had in this stretch, <laughs> was Matt Barkley, which sounds disgusting because I hate USC quarterbacks. But I look at the games <laughs> y'all lost, and those were all shootouts. Those were all like 60 points combined or higher. And if the Lions' offense, which has been janky at times, if they can really get it rolling, that's probably their best option is to just. You know, get the get the Packers in pace and get where the Lions are comfortable, which is taking a lead, trading it a couple times, maybe losing that lead in the fourth quarter and then having Matt Stafford come back and win the day. Or, you know, just I don't know that the defense has also looked a little better. But again, I'm suspect of of the Packers defense. So I think that if there's going to be a place for the Lions to strike, it's going to be there. So I would say for the Packers, if you want to stop them from getting in there, you've just got to really disrupt the the offense, which I mean, possible. A- absolutely, absolutely, totally possible. It's been a very weird year for the Lions. Matt Stafford, basically another key has to just play out of his mind. But every key I'm going to say just keeps coming back to the same damn thing. It's just you got to score points, which I mean, yeah, thanks, John Madden. I know scoring points. Wow. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that would actually be a victory? But... Okay, final prediction, score prediction. I'm sorry, I don't have many more keys. Uh, Matt Prater making a lot of field goals, maybe. Maybe finding the damn red zone once in a while. Okay. Starting early, actually, my friend brought, <laughs> Ryan brought this up. Ryan, you remember Ryan. He brought this up, actually, I think, on our podcast. Uh, get started fast early to get the... Um, to get the Ford Field crowd into it. I think the Ford Field crowd is really charged up, will be charged up for this, but I also know Detroit fans can be very fickle because they listen to 97.1, the ticket, and they are just generally just a very depraved, very angry kind of people. It's why people say I'm not a fan, because I don't have that power. (laughs) But final score prediction. You know, anything can happen in the in the NFL. And if you think about it, there's a 50 percent chance. There's yes, a 50 percent chance of anything happening. And I would like to see this game end in a tie. However, I don't think that's going to happen. I would like to see this game end 0-0, <laughs> just kneeling nonstop because both the, the Packers and <laughs> and Lions get into the playoffs that way. And it pisses off everyone, and it makes Al Michaels look like a mockery, and it probably makes Bob Costas' brain explode. But it won't happen. It won't happen. So in light of that, I'm going to have to go with a uh, unreal number, which is, uh, let's see here. I'm going to say Lions. 
let's go with six pi to 17. I think that's a Lions victory. All right. I don't know. <laughs> All right. And- I, I, I actually, I'm a, no, I was, I was just going to say I've won one of Jeremy's prediction. Our managing editor, Jeremy, does his prediction rounds up each week. I've actually won with one of my four pi to five answers before and on the Giants game. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty good at this. I'm an expert. <laughs> I, I, I have credentials. Well, you're you're with you're with an expert my, uh, myself because it uh, I've gotten one score prediction right, and that actually happened in week one, uh, Packers Jaguars. So um, it's nice to be. I'm sorry, I like like unless you can get me talking about like a spread in Vegas or the total, like I just I I have no. I have no real interest because here's the thing about score predictions. I always notice these guys who do the score predictions. It's always by like, if if, if they are going to say, oh, it's going to be a close game, they basically chicken out because they will always do this. You'll always notice this. Their predictions will always be something like 21 to 20. It'll be a one point difference. And what's the point of that? How many NFL games actually end in a one point margin of victory? That's nonsense. That's stupid. That's being a dunderhead. But we keep saying that because we think this is like, you know, basketball or something. Someone's going to have the final shot and you're basically, no, you're basically saying someone's going to miss an extra point in that final score. Is that what you're saying? I just, come on, man. I, I can't, I can't respect that. But, you know, everyone does this be- or it's like, or, you know, or it's Boomer and being like, well, I think, uh, it's going to end in a field goal. By the way, Green Bay is a three-point favorite on the road. So um, I would just say if you're a gambling sort like I am, a degenerate, I actually I see right now three and a half. So I would take Detroit plus three and a half. That gives me a cushion. Well, I mean, either, I think I think we can both find some common ground and that we're at, I know I know it really is tough to say this, but I think that we can find some common ground in saying that we're both going to be. Some, oh, absolutely. Uh, no. Yeah. Some Giants I, I, fans I hate this weekend, um, which that, that really that really hurts to say I mean, that look, really hurts Eli, to say that. But um, Eli Manning's face. But yeah, is I know. I know. Incredibly that. stupid. It is probably the most stupid looking face in the NFL and it's following along a very proud tradition <laughs> from his brother Peyton Manning and John Elway. He just has a really stupid looking face. But but I can put that to the side and people with stupid faces they they've done impressive things in this country. One of them's going to be our president. So, with that in mind, I'm just saying, maybe a little stupid face greatness is due on Sunday, and maybe Jason Pierre-Paul doesn't blow off his other hand. And, Uh, I mean, the skins, like, just, no one one gives a damn about them, man. Like, Washington Washington people don't even actually care about their own football team. It's, It's a very depraved kind of situation for them, and I don't even know how they handle it, but... You know, hey, you know, you you find ways to stave off that sinking feeling of death. <laughs> I'm just saying, let the lion, let the Giants win this one, and then let's just, or hey, you know what? If if Washington does win, let's just take knees or something. Does that still get us in the playoffs? I, yeah, 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 take take knees. Take I knees. think it does because I think we yes, both have ab- tiebreakers absolutely. over them. I think absolutely. I, think it, just, I mean, why why not do this, man? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> People, people need people need to listen to our podcast. That's yeah, that's sure, what it boils not? down to. But um, Chris, Chris, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, again, this is Chris Lemieux. He is joining us from Pride of Detroit. Um, go check him out, guys. That was very very entertaining for me, Chris, and the- um, shared a lot of laughs. You shared some some valid points about the Lions here, and I hope that your prediction is wrong. And but um. But yes, but you, thank you, thank you again for joining us, bud, and um, and go pack, go, I guess, and we'll thank we'll, you we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. By the way, if they want people want to find me, I'm on uh, Twitter at adequate host is where you can find me. I'm actually barely talking about football there. I mostly talk about like <laughs> Marxism and Asian politics. So I apologize. Hey, I, I apologize I for not plugging you here, Chris. Um. Well, yeah, everyone, yeah, no, everyone, it's fine. I'll, I'll do my own work. Everyone, everyone, apo- um, be uh, share share my apologies and go follow him on Twitter. And um, again, Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And have a have a merry, ho- hopefully, you had a merry Christmas and have a great New Year, bud. Happy Festivus, and once again, thank you for being you. <laughs> And
And now, ladies and germs, we will now get into our coverage of the green and gold, giving us the keys to a NFC North clinching, playoff clinching win is Brian Von Vera. Brian, what do the Packers have to do to win the NFC North and get into the playoffs? All right, I've got I've got two big matchups that they need to they need to take advantage of or win or whatever, however you want to look at it. Uh, one of them, man, if you watched this game of uh, Detroit against Dallas on Monday night. Dallas made that secondary and that defense as a whole just look foolish. And and that has me really, really excited because our offense is clicking at the right time and their defense is not. So it, I'm, I have a lot of confidence that we can put up a lot of points. We got to just tear that secondary to shreds. The only man that can seemingly slow us down is Darius Slay, their cornerback, uh, who did miss that game with a hamstring injury, practiced this week, looks like he might play. Um, but even if he does, you know, hamstring injuries are bothersome for a long time and he's definitely going to have lost a step. So man, watching, watching him try to line up across from Jordy might be a whole lot of fun for Packer fans. And it may just be another massive week for Jordy Nelson, um, who absolutely has to be the comeback player of the year. I don't see how anybody else even gets a shout. Um, got to exploit that one. The other one. They have two really good offensive tackles, Riley Reef and Taylor Decker. That has me a lot more nervous. Uh, this, this off, this defense struggles. This defense is incredibly inconsistent and especially the pass rush. Um, you know, one week we might get five sacks. The next week we might never even get in a quarterback's face. I think we're going to be a lot closer to the ladder on this one. I'm not sure that we can do it. And if we, if we sell out and try to blitz that edge, Stafford is so good at stepping up in the pocket and getting away from that. Makes the most frustrating play that the Packers face every year is Stafford stepping up in the pocket and releasing this little sidearm throw. I complain about it every time we play the Lions, and he just kills us with it every time. And he'll find an outlet, a, a running back, a tight end, something, and it'll always go for a first down. It drives me nuts. I'm really worried about that. So... So really we gotta, we gotta keep that pocket honest, especially the middle. Um, but if we can kind of flush him out with some pressure on the outside, I think that'll help too. So those are my two big takeaways. Um, just keep doing what you're doing on offense. Figure something out on defense just to, just to slow them down. Cause if this turns into, uh, a free for all where each team is scoring 40 plus points, Man, I don't know if I trust our defense if, if that offense gets the ball late. So figure something out, I guess. Um, having said that, I, man, I was very skeptical when Roger said we could run the table. Right now, I believe, but I'm also very, very, very nervous about this one. But I think we can put up a lot of points against this defense. So I'm going to say Packers do win this one. I'm going to say 35 24. Packers take home the NFC North crown. Oh, 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 that sounds so, so pleasant <laughs> in my ears, Brian. Yes, yes. So sir. pleasant, so pleasant in my earlobes. Um, Dusty, hey, you know I love I numbers. Do. You know I love numbers, and I need some right now. All right, uh, so I looked at a few things for this game. Uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was, so the Lions have nine wins. Uh, we know the Lions and Packers both are nine and six coming into this game. Uh, so one of the things I want to look at was uh, the expected wins based on points for and points, points against, because I believe the Lions have fewer points against, fewer points for than they do against, if, if only just a little. I think like, like negative five. So... I went to the Pythagorean expectation, which is something that was originally created by Bill James for the sabermetric movement uh, in baseball, was modified for football by the great, great football outsiders, where they basically, it's just a simple formula based on points for versus points against, and they see uh, what the expected, basically throughout history, what what the expected would have been based on points scored for and against. Uh, right now, Based on the points for and against, the Lions' expected uh, wins is 7.4, and they're at 9. Typically, when a team has uh, more than one above, more than one win above their expected wins, they're expected to fall back a little. It's kind of like a like a fool's gold thing, and, and sometimes that's that's usually seen the next season. But it also is an indication that a team is playing 
say their their win does their win record does not necessarily say how good of a team they are. So right now the Lions are 1.6 wins less expected than they actually have. So uh they are a decent team, but they're more a 7-win team than a 9-win team at this point in the season. Uh and the Packers are actually just outperforming by 0.6. So they are closer to uh say an 8 or a 9-win team than a 7-win team. So uh just looking at that, uh just looking at say true talent level based on that kind of stuff, uh the Packers are looking like the better team coming into this. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to look into was, uh, so we know Stafford, uh, I believe dislocated. I don't think he broke it. I think the initial reports were dislocated, dislocated his finger, uh, in the bears game. So coming into that bears game and through that bears game, he had 13 games. He was completing 66.7% of his passes at 7.4 yards per attempt. Touchdown percentage was 7, 4.7%. So that's percent, uh, percent attempts, uh, for every touchdown, basically. And interception was 1.5. In the two games since his injury, he's completing 58.8% down from 66.7. For 6.3 yards per attempt, he has not thrown a touchdown in the past two games as interception jumped from 1.5 to 2.4%. So, granted, two games is a very small sample size to look at those numbers. I totally get that. But if you look at what he's done so far this season, he's not had a two-stretch two game stretch that bad this entire season. So, uh, I mean, Brian, you mentioned the Cowboys game. What I saw in that Cowboys game, uh, especially second half was him trying to throw down field, man, like the spirals looked fine. His accuracy was all over the place. And Stafford, even going back to his Georgia days has never been known as an overly accurate quarterback, but he was looking decent this year. And I mean, that seems like that's gone. It, it's hard to have a dislocated finger and not have that affect your accuracy a little bit. So he is definitely taking a downward turn. Um, and and looking at again those interceptions, just one more thing I kind of want to look at from there. So we know that the Packers have turned around their uh, <laughs> their turnover ratio by a fairly large margin, which is uh, I mean just crazy what they've done over that time. The Lions. So I, I want to look just over the past three games. Over the past three games, the Lions are negative six in turnover ratio, while the Packers are plus twelve, plus twelve to negative six. Now, you could say that may turn around a little. Uh, obviously, the Packers got a little lucky in that Seahawks game, but there's also some skill there as well. They're hanging out on the ball. They're playing better where the Lions are kind of, again, Stafford's floating some throws. Um, I think uh, I don't see maybe one turnover from the Packers, but but Rodgers really isn't throwing any interceptions. I think he's thrown 14 in touchdowns since the last time he threw a pick. Um, but I think... This is a game I could see like close to the first half and then Stafford throwing a couple picks in the second half and then just, just completely getting away from it. So, uh, I, I can see some turnovers definitely swinging this game and definitely the way the Lions offense and the Packers defense have played. That's, that's very, very much in play. One final thing. When the Lions get to the red zone, Anquan Bolden is their main target. Uh, he has 21 targets, uh, in the red zone, which is good for, I think, 24% of their total targets in the red zone. Uh, for seven touchdowns. The next one, uh, as far as as many touchdowns as he scores, I don't even know if he's playing in this game, is Theo Riddick, who has 15, uh, 15 targets. He's got five touchdowns on his 15 targets. Uh, no one else has any more than two in the red zone. So if they get in the red zone, look for Anquan Bolden, who's traditionally has killed us, uh, and Theo Riddick. So I mentioned, uh, I can see it being close at the half. Packers pulling away in the second half, couple turnovers. Uh, I kind of see a big, uh, I, I see a decent win here. Uh, I see a 31 to 17 win. Packers hoist that NFC North flag. Everything's right in the world. Let's go. Let's go, guys. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the train, uh, moving on, on your segment, Dusty, where I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring a little bit of numbers myself into this, where, um, I know maybe maybe some of you fan, uh, Packer fans have been following the Lions a little bit um, after after the Packers Lions game, but um, you know Marvin Jones went off against the Packers in Week Three, um, two hundred five yards with two touchdowns, and um, since since that game, Marvin Jones has yet to record a one hundred yard receiving game, and he has not had a receiving touchdown since week six so take that big weapon take that big weapon that kind of kind of let the lions um come back in that game a little bit 
Put him up against the Dom Capers defense. Put him up against Oh, you're going the other way with this. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Brian, don't steal my thunder. (laughs) And, um, no, but, no, he he has not been playing good since that game. And I know, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm informing you, Packer fans, that he has been, he has been in a huge slump since that game. And, um, and we just got to focus our attention on Golden Tate and getting, and getting to Matthew Stafford and making his life a living heck, and I am predicting a Packers victory as well, and I'm going 31 to 21 Packers. And um, we we do. Do you have... guys want to know why Marvin Jones has been struggling? Why? Because right after that Packer game, I signed him on my fantasy team. <laughs> <laughs> you well, are makes, welcome. That makes... That makes the most sense of all time. Yeah, and um, we do. And I will. And I will take the role of Jordan right now, which I absolutely cannot Boo. stand. But I will do. But I. Will, but I will do it. And we have one Twitter question for you two, and that is from Paul F. Metter. Um, it is at P. F. Metter. If you want to follow him on the on the twit, and um, his question is. So what center does it better, Lindsley or Treader? And I will let you guys take it away. First of all, John, please don't call it the twit. I, it <laughs> makes me really, really uncomfortable. It, it also makes me uncomfortable. Well, I called it that, so deal with it. Ugh, I'm not going to deal with it. Just answer, 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 the, answer the GD question, Brian. Man, what's so beautiful about this question is that there's no wrong answer. Man, yeah. like you, you can almost interchange yep. them. And they're, you know, they're different players a little bit. But, man, it's really hard to pick. If I have to go with it, I'd say I prefer the strength and overall athleticism of J.C. Treader. But, man, I was I was a little concerned about a drop-off at the center position with how well he was playing earlier in the year, and then he got injured, Lindsley took over. That drop-off did not come. These are two really good and very young centers. Um Man, I, I I would personally give slight edge to J.C. Treader. Like I said, he's strong. Like as you saw him playing at left tackle last year, he showed his strength, and yeah, just ever so slightest of edges. Yeah, I mean, and I I actually may go the other way, but it may be uh, more because of um, of what Treader has done in other positions. It's less for me. It's less ooh, who does it better, at catcher, because like or, or catcher. <laughs> I got pitchers and catchers report in a little bit, man. I got okay. already <laughs> looking at they're looking how bad the Tigers are going to be this year. Uh, they're kind of interchangeable at center. Um, I, I think Lindsley, Lindsley's maybe a little smoother, uh, maybe a little smarter. Uh, but I mean, it, it like anything that's not downplaying Treader, like the difference is somewhat neglig- ne- negligible. Num, num, num. Uh, I will say that for me, the difference kind of more lays in, uh, where Treader's other strengths could be. Lindsley, Lindsley seems like a center. Uh, you could push him to guard if you felt like you needed to. Uh, Treader seems like he could play anywhere. Like he's not a guy I'd want starting left tackle every single game, but I feel like he could, like he could man that in a pinch and I don't feel the same way about Lindsley. So for me, I think it comes down to they're both great at center. And man, that's a great problem to have. You got two guys that can man the middle, uh, that are, that are both terrific. For me, it kind of comes down to, uh, Treader plays well other spots he plays better than Lindsley does so I'd rather have Lindsley in the middle and Treader as an emergency if needed to but I mean really I I feel comfortable with either guy uh at center which is which is pretty remarkable well there guys we like I said before and I'll always say it we love when you send in your Twitter questions so don't stop Hopefully, we'll be talking about uh, Packers playoffs here in a little bit. And before we get into our final thoughts, um, Jordan actually just texted me with his final score prediction, (laughs) and he is predicting he is predicting the Lions to win fifty-seven to three. (laughs) So, um, so um, cut him. Cut him. Jordan is no Jordan. Jordan is no longer allowed to be on this podcast, (laughs) and um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry to inform you via podcast, Jordan. So. Um, but yes, now to our final thoughts segment, Brian, what are your final thoughts for us tonight? Uh, first of all, if the score ends up being 57 to three lions, I, I'm going to be really scared. Okay. Um, my final (laughs) thought, uh, a little bit of crow eating about Mike McCarthy. Um, 
I'm not calling for his head right now, as as you can see. I'm I'm gonna preface this by saying the fact that our offense is doing really well now and our team is winning games again does not mean that people like me were wrong to question him earlier in the year or were wrong to call for his head earlier in the year. He was giving us little to no reason to believe that this team was going to turn things around. But better late than never, he finally, 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 after a year and a half of struggling, finally figured something out, got things going the way they needed to be going. I don't know. Maybe it was only the fact that Jordy got healthy. I don't know. But he's got this offense humming again, um, back to the level seemingly that they were at in 2014 maybe. It's just playing really good football right now, and i got to give him credit there. So, good work, Mike McCarthy, saving your job, saving our season, saving our franchise, however you want to look at it. Good work. Got to give credit where it's due. All right, only other last thought, just uh, holiday shout-outs. Uh, make sure you listen to The Sweep, our other podcast. Make sure you're checking out everything that is put up on our wonderful website, packtothefuture.com. And a special shout-out to our producer, Josh Shack. does a really good job editing this podcast and making it sound oh so beautiful and crisp every week, so... Thank you for that. Yes, he does. All right. You can find us Thank on you, Josh. You can find us on Twitter at PTTF underscore podcast and me at PTTF underscore Brian. And Dusty, your final thoughts of the evening. Listen, don't freak out, but I got five. But I'm gonna get through them real quick. <laughs> I'm gonna get through them real quick. One of them one of them is just a stat that I wanted to bring up in the stat section I totally forgot. And it's short. And it's awesome. So over their last three games, the Lions defense are allowing touchdowns in the red zone 85.7% of the time. 85.7% of the time, offenses are in the red zone against the Lions defense. That's a big They're giving up a touchdown. So that's exciting. Uh, Second final thought. I always look at cheap tickets. Man, I thought I was going to find some super, super cheap ones uh, this week 17. A lot of meaningless games out there. And I found some, but not as many as I thought. In fact, I didn't find even one as cheap as the San Diego Cleveland game last week, which was $9, and you could have seen the Cleveland get a win in that one. This one, cheapest one this this week, if you want to go to an NFL game, which I am kind of maybe considering, Houston Texans at 9-6, and six, division winners rolling into Tennessee, the 8-7 and seven Titans for $11. Now, guys, here's what you get with this one. You get a quarterback matchup. Of Tom Savage versus Matt Castle. That's Tom <laughs> Savage versus Matt Castle. I'm super sad baby, about baby. Marcus Mariota breaking his leg. I am super happy about Brock Eisweiler getting benched. So this is a stat Preach. I looked up. I spent a little bit of time on pro football uh, references. Play index looking this up. Savage replaced Osweiler a couple weeks ago. Since then, he's thrown 65 passes and has not thrown a touchdown. Going all the way back to 1968... He's the 27th quarterback to throw at least 27 passes without throwing a touchdown. There was actually more than I thought. I didn't think there was going to be that many. At the very, very top of that list, go back to 1998, Bobby Hoying for the Eagles, 224 passes without throwing a touchdown. That's that's bonkers insane. The most, the most recent one before this, and I think he was second on the list, again, going back to 68, was Ryan Lindley back in 2012 who threw 171 passes without throwing a touchdown. So, Tom Savage, you got a long way to go before you catch those guys, but I believe in you. <laughs> I believe you can throw more passes without throwing a touchdown. You He's still it. better than Brock Osweiler. He is better than Brock Osweiler. Leave That's Brock alone. Thing. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> You're off that train, Brian. I know you are. Uh, all right, third. I want to say I did not like all the overplay the relaxed stuff got uh, a couple years ago with Aaron Rodgers. I thought that was overhyped. Too many people talking about it really got on my nerves for some reason. I'm really digging the run the table stuff. (laughs) Uh, I know it was not a guarantee. Uh, He just kind of brought up, hey, it'd be nice to run the table. Uh, But that feels like more of a rallying point. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, again, the relaxed stuff really got on my nerves. I'm a big fan of run the table. So uh, just, just keep running, boys. We got one more game. Well, then we got like we got five more games. It's a battle cry, Dusty. I know. It's a battle cry. I know, and I think that's what does it. You know, he was really calm when he said the relax. Run the table feels a little more fierce. I'm digging yes, it. Yes, sir. Sweet. Uh, yes, num- sir. Number four, shout out to myself. 
for winning a fantasy football championship. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a, yep. I'm in a work yeah, league. Yeah, buddy. I get the, the people, the person that holds the trophy before me is out this week, so I'm not able to get it. But next week, I will be hoisting the Ray Nitschke Memorial Fantasy Football Trophy, and it will live in my office for the next year. By the way, so Jordan also won a fantasy that. trophy that was previously held by John. So Jordan gets Ooh. to rip it from John's fingers. All right. <laughs> He should have done that last week when he was up there. Actually, (laughs) I never got the trophy from Aaron Oberly, so Aaron, if you are listening, (laughs) you are the biggest piece of crap. Actually, no, I love you, Aaron. But uh, Aaron Aaron gets me free brewer tickets, so I can't rip too much. (laughs) But um, I never got my trophy. So, Jordan, you're going to have to get your trophy from Aaron. Sorry. All right. Last final thought, and then I'm done. Um, we all know 2016 has been a rough year for celebrity deaths. Uh, I know I got uh, a little a little worked up over Bowie. Um, man, Carrie Fisher died a couple days ago, and that one's hitting me hard. Man, we've been going back, we've been rewatching Star Wars, um, and then just even going to the new one. I wrote about it a little this week. I don't want to get too deep into it because much smarter, more eloquent people will talk about it. But um, having a young daughter and seeing her in those in the original trilogy as being this strong woman. Uh, you see her, how strong she becomes in The Force Awakens when her brother leaves and her husband leaves uh, just due to this pain and she stays and she fights and she becomes this general and she just the embodiment of strong and beyond that, just the way Carrie Fisher lived, the way she talked, uh, the things she overcame, the openness which she talked about her struggles, uh, just such a strong, insightful, uh, by all accounts, loving, caring woman. Um just ridiculously sad that she's gone. Uh, I'm glad that she kind of made a little bit of resurgence with Star Wars. Um, kind of, uh, there's just generations are going to see her and just, uh, if nothing else, know her from that. Um, so, uh, RIP Carrie Fisher. Preach. And Dusty, mm. one last thing. Yes. Where can we find you on Twitter? You can find me at Dusty Evely. Uh, and guys, don't forget, um, if you like what you hear, or even if you don't, uh, rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, just helps uh, more people kind of kind of see the podcast, kind of grow us a little bit. Uh, so more than so, that'd be uh, that's exciting. So we we would like that. So if you get a chance, go on iTunes, rate and review us. Thank you, thank you for that, Dusty. And um, I will have two um, final thoughts for you guys tonight. And it kind of, I mean, in a way, it goes hand in hand with what Dusty was saying. But um, I saw um, Rogue One on Monday and so good i i don't Mm. and i don't know i don't know if you guys feel the same way but i thought that was one of the most i mean obviously it was it was super good but it was one of the most depressing star wars movies i have seen i think it might be the most depressing star wars movie ever. stop before you spoil stuff Stop before you spoil I, stuff. I, and I, and, I was and depressed I, by I was, Jar Jar Binks, but it was a different kind of depressed. <laughs> <laughs> that was far more depressing than anything I saw in The Force Awakens. Well, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, Rogue I'm, Rogue I'm One, glad sorry. that I, I'm glad that you brought that to my attention, Brian. And I will not spoil anything, but that was one of the most depressing. Yet it was so good. So um, good. Star mm-hmm. Wars movies I have I have seen in my life. And then my other final thought is uh, coming up on Monday. I get to see. Obviously, obviously, I'm a Bucks fan, number one, but I also love the NBA um, very, very much. And on Monday, I get to see Mr. Triple Double himself, oh, nice. Russell Westbrook, in Milwaukee. Oh. He recorded he recorded his fifteenth triple double this season already um, a couple days ago. And Unreal. this dude is he's always been one of my most favorite players to watch. So I am getting very jacked up to see him while celebrating a Packers NFC North division title and hopefully pushing onward to a Super Bowl. Um, hopefully, hopefully um, I'm not just getting ahead of myself, but um, guys like Dusty said before, rate and review us on iTunes. Please join us next week to talk about some Packers football again and have a very blessed new year's and we will catch you guys next week. 